and as the classroom management. Classroom management may be defined as the process of organizing and controlling the physical and social environment in the classroom to achieve educational goals. It may also be defined as the efficient control and efficient use of available resources in the classroom to promote learning. The physical environment includes tangible objects or physical entities like the teacher's table and chair, pupils' tables and chairs or desks, the chalkboard, duster, textbooks, audiovisual aids, wall charts and pictures, cupboards and cabinets, and the teacher and pupils. The teacher and pupils in a classroom constitute a social unit and the types of interactions between the teacher and pupils constitute the social environment. Class management includes all the strategies that the teacher uses to bring the harmony into the teaching and learning environment. The teacher as a manager of his class performs some management functions. These include planning what to teach, how and when to teach. This is done by preparing a lesson plan. The teacher also budgets for the material and human resources he will need in the teaching learning environment. He is also expected to organize by arranging, assembling and using the physical and human resources to achieve stated objectives. He also controls by directing the teaching learning process from beginning to end until the set objectives are obtained. Finally the teacher performs the management function of problem solving by ensuring that the class environment is free of conflict and conducive for learning as well as helping individuals to deal with their personal, academic and social problems. To perform these functions the teacher must have competence in subject matter knowledge and in action system knowledge. In addition to these he must have a positive consistent and firm personality that will empower him to exercise the influence on his class to achieve his set objectives. Elements of Effective Classroom Management Classroom management systems include routine ways of managing instructional and behavioral interactions in the classroom. Six key elements of effective classroom management are Planning Establishing usable rules Getting off on a good start. Monitoring the classroom environment. Keeping records efficiently. Creating strategies for managing interruptions. Importance of managing the classroom. 1. Good classroom management helps to promote discipline in the classroom to enhance teaching and learning. 2. It ensures harmony during the teaching and learning environment. 3. It again ensures healthy conditions under which classroom activities can be carried out effectively. 4. It again promotes the development of good behavior and accepted patterns of life among peers. 5. Classroom management encourages the development of leadership skills among pupils. 6. Good classroom management again helps to monitor pupils' progress in the classroom. Motivation Motivation comes from the Latin word movere, which means to move. Left and defined it as any condition, usually internal, that appears by inference to initiate, activate or maintain an organism's goal-directed behavior. Motivation as it relates to the classroom can be seen as a process of arousing and sustaining the interest of pupils in class activities. Theories of Motivation These are theories that explain the process of motivation. They include historical explanations, the behaviorist approach, the humanistic approach, and cognitive theories. Historical Explanations these are earlier theories that were generated to explain the concept of motivation. They include, the instinct theory which says that complex, unlearned patterns of behavior common to an entire species account for behavior. The arousal theory proposed biological explanations. Theorists of this orientation propounded that increasing arousal is defined by psychological changes such as we experience in respiration and heart rate. 
This is normally accompanied by increasing alertness or wakefulness and ranges from very low state for example sleep and boredom to very high state such as panic and anxiety. People try to maintain an optimal level of arousal for maximally effective behavior. Behaviorist approach. These theorists stress the importance of positive and negative extrinsic reinforcers. These are external influences that are brought to bear on the individual to arouse and sustain his interest in an activity. One important reinforcer is praise. The effectiveness of praise depends to a large extent on the kind of interpretation the pupil gives to the situation. Praise should therefore be used systematically, deliberately, and intelligently. Humanistic approach. These theorists on motivation emphasize intrinsic or internal motives such as those relating to autonomy, competence, and self-actualization. Consequently, educators who ascribe to this orientation are especially concerned with the personal development of students and the enhancement of positive self-concepts. Abraham Maslow's humanistic theory presents a hierarchical arrangement of need systems, with physiological needs at the lowest level known as basic needs. At the highest level is the need for self-actualization, also known as meta-needs. Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs Cognitive Approach Cognitive theorists on motivation describe humans as active, exploring, evaluating organisms capable of delaying gratification and of explaining the outcomes of their one behaviors. Albert Bandura, one of the cognitive theorists proposed that the idea of self-efficacy that is personal effectiveness is important for determining which behaviors will be undertaken. He added that children are least likely to attempt activities when they expect failure and the amount of effort that will be put in an activity will be greater if success is anticipated. Judgments of self-efficacy are affected by the following. Inactive influences, Successful outcomes increase positive judgment. Vicarious influences. Perseosity influences. Emotive influences. Efficacy. Comparisons with others. Persuasion by others. High arousal can increase or decrease judgments of. Self Wainer is another cognitivist who propounded the attribution theory. This theory says that individuals tend to attribute their success or failures to internal or external causes. Internal causes refer to one's ability and effort, while external causes refer to difficulty or luck. Those who make attribution to internal causes are said to have internal locus of control, while those who make external attributions are said to have external locus of control. Types of motivation. The two types of motivation are intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. 1. Intrinsic motivation. This is a type of motivation that comes from within an individual. It is a self-imposed motivation. The intrinsic motivation is the type where the learner is moved from within to perform a task without any external influence. It is influenced by self-interest and excitement. 2. Extrinsic motivation. The extrinsic motivation is externally imposed. It is a type of influence that comes from outside to induce learning. What triggers the extrinsic motivation is the use of rewards, praises, grades, promotions and interest teachers show in pupils' achievements. When one performs an act because someone has influenced him her to do it, then that person has been motivated extrinsically. Importance of motivation. 1. Motivation puts learners on their toes as rewards and praises make them alert. 2. It encourages students to contribute during instructions. 3. Motivation gives students the courage to think more on a topic. 4. It again enables the teacher to secure the attention of the class. 5. 
It again creates interest and excitement that is necessary for classroom learning. Strategies for motivating learners 1. Teachers should plan their work to meet the different levels of aspirations among the pupils. Make provision for different materials, activities and projects for pupils of different abilities and aspirations. 2. Provoke the pupil's curiosity at the set induction stage. For instance, the teacher can pose a problem or give a pretest. 3. Encourage self competition rather than making individuals compete against each other. Use group cooperation and team competition. 4. Use appropriate teaching learning materials and practical experiences in the teaching and learning process. 5. Use games, dramatization, and role play to get pupils involved and to participate in lessons. 6. The use of praises, marks, rewards, gifts, etc., especially for average, slow learners and those who lack self assurance. 7. Respect the needs and nature of students. Recognize differences in the abilities of students and set standards for performance that are congruent with what students can accomplish. Reward effort. Nevertheless maintain standards for good work. 8. Take pupils on field work or field trips to change classroom atmosphere. 9. Set goals that are realistic and achievable because when tasks become too difficult for students, it may discourage them. 10. Provide regular feedback to pupils to inspire them to put in more effort in their learning. 11. Show attitudes of acceptance of pupils so that they will feel loved and have a sense of belonging. Organizing routine activities. Classroom routine activities. A routine refers to a fixed and regular way of doing things. Classroom routine activities therefore refer to the sequence of activities and events which occur regularly in the classroom. As these activities are repeated regularly, they become a matter of exactly what activities are to take place and at what time. Kinds of routine activities in the classroom. Some of the routine activities in the classroom include the following. 1. Asking politely for a thing or favor. 2. Greeting of teacher by pupils as he or she enters the classroom. 3. Asking permission before leaving the class. 4. Getting up and responding to greetings when a visitor enters the classroom. 5. Raising up one's hand before answering or asking a question in class. 6. Maintaining silence and attention whilst the teacher teaches. 7. Orderly distribution and collection of exercise books and other teaching materials. 8. Seating arrangements. 9. Checking the roll. 10. Use and cleaning of the chalkboard by teacher and pupils. Assigning roles and responsibilities in the classroom. To ensure that pupils obey rules and regulations in the classroom the teacher has to give various roles and responsibilities to some pupils. Among these roles given to pupils are Class Prefect Cupboard Monitor Sanitary Prefect In giving out the roles to students the teacher needs to consider the gender aspect as well as the individual differences. This will ensure fair or balanced assigning of roles. There is no strict role that only boys or girls can perform. Encouraging pupils to follow classroom routines. To encourage pupils to follow routine activities in the classroom, the teacher has to motivate pupils using both tangible and intangible rewards. Tangible rewards include gifts such as chalk, books, pencils and pens, good terminal reports, etc. Intangible rewards include good remarks, applauses, praises, etc. Classroom seating and arrangement. Classroom furniture always has some influence on the learning atmosphere to some extent, 
but the choice is sometimes outside the control of the teacher as they are often fixed or too heavy to move. In situations where the chairs and tables desks are freestanding, they can be rearranged to have a flexible seating pattern to full advantage of the lesson. In other situations where they are fixed or where they are too heavy to move, the teacher may be left no choice than to stick to the original arrangement. Some classroom seating arrangements. A simplerus seat in gin rows, the size T most common seating arrangement used in Ghanaian schools. Desks tables are arranged in rows and columns with spaces between them and the teacher's seat in front facing the class. See diagram below. Be horseshoe or semicircular arrangement. This is sometimes described as circular seating, but it is in the form of a semicircle with pupils facing the teacher in the middle. It allows for face-to-face -face contact and is suitable for a small class. See diagram below. Teacher. Advantages. 1. It makes the classroom relaxed and friendly. 2. A few TLM can be effectively used. 3. It makes it easy for children to show ideas. 4. It enables the teacher to establish eye contact with the pupil to exercise control of the class. 5. Suitable for lessons like storytelling. Disadvantages. 1. It makes it easy for pupils to copy from each other. 2. Classroom atmosphere becomes informal and degenerate into disorder. 3. Movement is hindered to some extent. Groups around desks. This is where pupils are seated around desks located separately from each other. The number of pupils per desk depends on the required size of groups and the number of pupils in the class. See diagram below. Advantages. 1. Grouping is easy. 2. Create forum for collaborative and participatory learning. 3. A few TLM are utilized. 4. Very useful for practical works like science. 5. Creates opportunity for children to develop leadership and other social skills. Disadvantages. 1. Movement is difficult for the teacher and pupils. 2. It creates fertile grounds for fidgeting and disorder. 3. Children tend to copy from each other instead of learning. 4. Class control is not easy. Factors to consider in seating pupils. 1. Friendships and familiarity. 2. Pupils interest. 3. Visual problems. 4. Auditory problems. 5. The level of the class. Other factors. A. Height problems. B. The nature of the furniture. C. The size of the classroom and the number of pupils. D. The nature of the activity to be performed. Managing instructional time. The instructional time is also known as the contact hour. It is the time frame for interaction between the teachers and the students to do an activity. The instructional time is only the period the teacher meets the class to give them an instruction. Any meeting out of this period even though is part of the actual curriculum of the school is not part of the instructional time. For for example interaction during break, dining period, games etc. do not form part of the instructional time. Misuse of instructional time. Instructional time is misused in several ways. Among them are 1. Late starting of classes. This can be caused by a natural occurrence like heavy downpour or sickness. It can also be artificial like laziness, traffic or intentional. Whichever way that it occurs it affects the instructional time. Two. Early closing of school. This may be caused by some factors like closing early to attend a program or laziness on the part of the school authority. 3. Teacher absenteeism.
Any time a teacher does not come to school, it affects instructional time. 4. Selection in subjects on the timetable. When teachers intentionally neglect some subjects at the expense of others, it leads to waste of instructional time. 5. Holidays. Most of the time there are so many public holidays that force school authorities to close down schools. It affects the instructional time. 6. Spending part of the time to organize sporting and cultural activities, for for example some days are lost to sporting and cultural activities in the course of the term. These affect instructional time. 7. Organizing staff meeting during instructional hours. Hence any incident that prevents the teacher from meeting a class for instruction accounts for mismanagement of instructional time. Effective management of instructional time. Bells or drums should be used to signal the beginning and end of a lesson. Teachers as well as the pupils should work with the bell or drum. Lesson notes should be prepared to cover all the subjects on the timetable. Adhere to the lesson in the duration you prepared and your teaching. Holidays should be reduced by policy makers and the government. Pupils should not be allowed to play beyond the official duration given. Co-curricular activities should be held outside the normal instructional time. Aside the above, Crowell, Comiskey and Pottle have given the following suggestions on how to maximize the use of instructional time. 1. Keep students motivated. 2. Keep instruction on students' levels. Instructions that students find to be either too easy or too difficult will make them lose interest. 3. Keep students active. Lessons should be composed of activities that are meaningful and promote the achievement of instructional objectives. 4. Be organized and prepared. Anticipate problems. 5. Delegate responsibilities when appropriate. Call responsible students to help with administrative functions that are within their range of capabilities so that you can concentrate on essential matters and teaching. 6. Turn on your radar and watch for students whose attention is drifting. Order and discipline in the classroom. Order is submission or compliance to rules and regulations for fear of punishment, fear of losing a favor or in anticipation for some favor. When a student obeys school rules and regulation for fear that he she would be punished, the student is said to be respecting order. Similarly if a truant feels he she would be discriminated against in the distribution of prizes to well-behaved students and therefore changes. He is said to be following or being submissive to order. Any change in behavior that is motivated by needs, fear or discrimination, fear of punishment, etc., is said to be the result of order. Order is therefore externally imposed. The use of force and forms of punishment may work to some extent, at least for some time. Such disciplinary methods are based on fear. Discipline is defined as readiness or ability to respect authority and observe conventional or established laws of a society or of any other organization. Discipline means self-control, restraint, respect for self.